We've spent a good deal of time with Jesus on mountains. Last couple of Sundays we have been with Jesus as he preached his Sermon on the Mount. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives some practical instruction for how we're to live our lives in the world as his followers. But this Sunday, the Sunday of Transfiguration, we're on a very different mountain with Jesus. And things get very weird. <laughs> Jesus takes a couple of his disciples up the mountain. And there he is transfigured before them. His garments are white as snow. There is a blinding light. Moses, Elijah appear and there is a voice from heaven this is my son listen to him it's it's very strange on the sermon on the mount we had jesus teaching about marriage about divorce about indebtedness about injustice and enemies in the real world but on this mountain, there is no ethics, there's no instruction for us about what we're to do. No, on this mountain, it's, it's more what God does. And what God does on this mount is weird. And I know you, you are sophisticated, educated, 21st century, empirically based, modern people. I can almost feel you get jittery when Steed was reading this morning's gospel. This is the kind of material that, that is, let us say, a challenge for us. Before you dismiss this strange story on the Mount of Transfiguration, may I just suggest that maybe as 21st century North American people, Maybe our view of reality in modernity has not grown, but it's shrunk. Maybe we just don't have adequate imaginations for thinking in the way that this story pushes us to think. Years ago, Morton Keltsey, a sociologist of religion, did a study among Roman Catholic laity on their mystical experiences. And Kelsey found out that the average Roman Catholic layperson reported having had one life-changing, transformative, mystical experience in life. At least one. And yet when further probed, they said, and I've never told anybody about it. Kelsey said, well, why wouldn't you tell your priest? Your, your priest is in the mystical business. Uh, and you know the predominant response. He would think I was crazy. Huh. You, you know, it is as if there is a kind of policing going on in modern life. To make sure that reality stays down in the valley, that we stay firmly fixed to the world of taste and touch and, 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 and we, we dismiss from the conversation anything that gets too strange. You know how we think. You're confronted by something strange in the world. What do you do? Your brain immediately starts rummaging about in your human experience and you try to think of a previous experience that you can match up with this experience. And then, then you say, yeah, I understand it. Got it. Got it. But here on the Mount of Transfiguration, as Jesus is transformed before our eyes and it is as, as if the veil between heaven and earth is pulled back for a moment, and we see, and there is a voice. This is something you cannot fit in your past experience. This is something that has come to you rather than something produced by you. 
That's what we, we often call the Christian faith a revealed religion. A revealed religion. That's just a fancy way of saying you can't come up with Christianity on your own. You, this is a story you cannot tell yourself. It has come to you as revelation. As gift. You don't really discover Christianity. In a sense, it discovers you. You don't come to this faith. It comes to you. And uh, I, I'm just saying that, that that's a very different way of thinking about thinking than we normally think about thinking. <laughs> the writer Frederick Beekner tells about a, a friend of his died and a couple of weeks later he and his wife went to spend a weekend with a widow hoping to help her in her adjustment and Bigner said that after dinner and conversation uh, they went to bed, went to sleep and there in the middle of the night he said suddenly I startled awake and I looked down in front of the bed where we were sleeping and there was my friend a and I said uh, Teddy I I is that you and my friend didn't speak but he smiled as he always smiled and without a word he he reached down and he plucked up a tuft of wool from the carpet and he held out his hand in front of me and then he let that tuft of wool just fall to the floor. And then without a word, he just disappeared. Beekner says, I was badly shaken, but somehow I managed to go back to sleep. But when I woke up the next morning, I sat up in bed and I told my wife, I've had the strangest dream last night. It was just like Teddy was here. He was back. And he said, I got out of bed, and I, I said, he, he was standing right here, right here in front of the bed, right? And he, he said, I looked down on the carpet, and here was a tuft of wool there on the carpet. And my wife assured me it was not there the day before. Beekner says, okay, I don't, I don't know what to make of such an event. I wouldn't want to work up some kind of theology from that about life or life beyond life. But then Beekner says, we're all though living our lives on the basis of some definition of reality. What is probable? What is possible? What if, Beekner asks, what if there are moments when the veil between the world we think we know and the world that we have yet to know, what if that veil is just pulled back for a moment and we see, we get a glimpse of, of something more. Uh, on the way to the cross, here in Matthew 17, Jesus withdraws from the journey and goes up a mountaintop with a couple of his disciples. And there before his astonished disciples, Jesus changes form. He shines like the sun. Moses, great giver of the law. Elijah, the most famous of the prophets. Moses and Elijah have come back from the dead. They're walking and talking with them. And then they disappear. And all you've got is Jesus. And there is a voice from heaven. This is my son. Listen to him. I find it interesting that Matthew, in the rest of his gospel, never refers to this moment again. For all we know, the disciples didn't come down from the mountain and say to their fellow disciples, we have just had a weird experience on the mountain. And yet, and yet they go back down to the valley different. They, whatever happened on that mountain, it's enough. Jesus goes on to his cross. The disciples go on to follow him to their crosses. I think that's why the church tells us this story here on the last 
Sunday of the season after the Epiphany, we get this epiphanic theophany, this strange, weird vision before we walk for the next 40 days to the cross with Jesus. And though you can't explain it, and though I, I, I don't know what the ethical implications of this are, it, it's enough. It, it's enough to go on. I think this may be one reason you are here this morning. Hoping, even if you don't know it, that, hoping for an epiphany, hoping that that veil will be parted just to give you a glimpse of more than you could have seen if you'd been left to your own devices. I remember after a Easter Sunday in the church I was serving and the choir had sung and we had prayed and the people had sung and I had delivered my sermon, a man walked out the door and uh, he said, hey, good, good service today. And I said, oh, uh, what, what was good about it? He said, uh, by the way, if I die right now, it's okay. I'm okay. Just want you to know that. I think that was a testimony. The, the veil had been, all he had, he'd gotten a glimpse. And that becomes enough. Peter impulsively wants to build three booths. One for you, Lord. One for Moses. One for Elijah. Let's fix this vision up here permanently. Let's build a big building here and let's stabilize this and keep it on the mountain forever so we can just go back and visit this anytime we want to. No. It, it's, a, it's just a glimpse. It's a moment of transcendence and yet it's enough. In a few moments we come down here and we have communion. And Wesleyans believe, with John Wesley believing with the whole church, that when we have communion, more is going on here than simply eating the bread and the wine. The Christ is bodily present with us. Now why do we believe? We believe that not simply because it's standard Christian doctrine, but we believe it because millions have experienced it. And even though they can't explain it, don't want to explain it, they, can, they testify. I, I have seen the Lord. And, and it's that, these glimpses that, that keep you going. I had a woman in my church. She gave birth to a child with special needs very special needs. Six months after the child was born, her husband walked out on her saying, I just can't handle this. But the church marveled at how well she handled it. And she loved that child and she saw what some would see as a burden, she saw as a blessing. Nineteen years later, the child, having lived a lot longer than the doctors predicted he would live when we had that child's funeral. I, I said to her afterwards, I said, you know, you must be the strongest person in the world. You, your resilience, you're, you're just amazing. And she said, well, fortunately, I didn't have to do it by myself. I said, oh. And she said, everything changed when Tommy was seven, but we'd had a day in which he acted like he was two or three. And there had been one tantrum after another, and finally I said, Tommy, I can't take it anymore. You sit down in that chair and you look out that window for the garbage van to come, and don't you move from there. And I walked down the hall, I went into the kitchen, and I stood before the sink and I thought, I can't do this. I just can't continue. But I heard something behind me and I looked down that darkened hall and he was looking out that window. 
His mouth was wide open in amazement. And he was smiling. He was looking out that window at the wonder of the garbage man showing up. And the sunlight shone on his face. And I looked down that hall and he looked like some kind of angel sent from God. And I was given a gift of being able to see my son the way God saw him. And it was only a glimpse, but she said it, it was enough. It, it kept me going. By the grace of God, sometimes you're just here out of habit. You're just going through the motions. And suddenly things get transfigured and weird. And you get more out of church than you brought to church. Sometimes by the grace of God, you're handed a piece of bread. And suddenly Christ is near you and with you and in you. It can't be explained. It can only be received. It's just a glimpse. But thank God it's enough as we leave here and move toward the cross. Amen.